Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. Since 1990, the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii has been following our mission of promoting human health, animal rights, and protection of the environment by means of vegetarian, whole food, plant-based, vegan education as we've grown to become one of the largest all-volunteer, nonprofit vegetarian societies in the nation. It's now time to introduce our special guest. We're thrilled to have with us tonight Dr. Terry Shintani, MD, JD, MPH, KGCSJ. Dr. Shintani received his master's degree in nutrition at Harvard University and his medical and law degrees at the University of Hawaii. He is board certified in preventive medicine, is the chair of the International Holistic Therapy Association and a member of the Council of Elders of Traditional Hawaiian Healers, as well as a Knight Commander of Grace of St. John, a Christian, chivalric, and philanthropic order. In 1992, he published his results showing a reversal of markers for chronic disease, such as a reduction in cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure, and weight, and has updated his program over the years to stay current with scientific research. He has been featured in Newsweek, on CBS This Morning, CNN News, Dateline, NBC, and the Encyclopedia Britannica. Dr. Shantani has written 15 books, including the Eat More, Way Less Diet, the Hawaii Diet, and the Peace Diet. I'd like to refer you to peacediet.org to see more about this one. He is formally designated a living treasure of Hawaii. He has conducted health programs in Hawaii for over 29 years and has a YouTube channel at askdrshintani.com. Dr. Shintani's presentation tonight is entitled, How to Live to Be 120, Healthy Longevity in the 21st Century. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Terry Shintani. Uh, and thank you all for uh, spending your evening uh, with us this evening. Just to give you a little bit of background, how many of you are interested in living 120 years? <laughs> Not everybody. Well, what if you could function well? What if you were really healthy? How many of you would like that? Right, because I think people automatically think of Longevity, especially if you get really old, that you start falling apart. So I'm the same way. So that's why I add with vibrant longevity. Nobody wants to live long if they're not healthy. So we're going to talk about that tonight. When I started in my college days, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went to law school, and I hated it. I call myself a recovering lawyer. And I thought the legal system was broken. So I went to medical school, and I hated it because I thought the medical system was broken. How many of you would agree our medical system is broken? So look, look at all the hands going up. I wish we had a camera on all the hands. Just about everybody's hands go up. Now think about this. If the health system was actually working, shouldn't costs be going down? Right? How many would agree with that? See, everybody agrees with that. Because, you see, if the health system was actually working, we should be getting healthier, right? And if we're getting healthier, then we'd need less medication, fewer doctor visits, fewer hospitalizations, and the cost should be going down, right? How many agree with that? Sure. And then you'd get a notice from HMSA or Kaiser or UHA or any of these, oh, um, Health costs have gone down, so your premiums are going to be 20% less this year. Everybody's laughing because it's like dream on, because it never happens. And so I believe that a whole person, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual approach would be better than our pharmaceutical-centered approach. How many agree with that? There we go. So that's what I'm about, because I got so fed up with our medical system uh, that I started looking at other ways of, uh, of health. 
And because you already said you agreed that a physical, mental, emotional, spiritual approach would be better, then you won't mind me starting with a prayer to acknowledge the spiritual side of health. All right, let us bow our heads. Let us pray. Maka inoa no o kamakua, meke keiki, meka uhane hemulene, e ai mai iau, a inoho puko uhane, e kukua mai ka uhana ana. Most gracious Heavenly Father, blessed be thy name. We thank you for all of your blessings, and humbly we ask your blessing on this gathering. Father, we ask that everyone here experience the glory of thy healing. Allow them to learn of the health value of the food you have put, in, put here on earth for all of us and allow us to be healed in body, mind, and spirit so that we may all serve thee better. Those things we pray no kamea no ke apuni ameka mana ameka vaonani ia amaloa atu. Amen and amen. And thank you for allowing me to do that. So um, tonight we're going to talk about how to live to be 120 years with vibrant longevity. Now, I have to tell you that I go to about four conferences a year uh, on different topics because uh, I've learned that the science is moving so fast now that every, every new conference I go to, I, I find out new things because those of you who have seen my talk before will realize that my talks have changed almost every Time because I keep updating it and they keep changing faster and faster. And okay, so I have heard that people of ancient times lived as long as 120 years with no sign of weakening, but today people are weak and sick at the age of less than 60. Is this due to a change in nature or due to humanity's faults? So those of you who haven't seen this talk before, how long ago do you think this was written? Wild guess. Anybody? Nobody wants to venture a guess? Any guess? This year. This year? <laughs> wow, well, that would, it would still apply to this year, wouldn't it? Actually, this was written 4,500 years ago in the oldest textbook, the Mei Ching. But you notice here it said 120 years. In ancient times, they acknowledged that people could live 120 years. Do you know where else it says 120 years? Genesis 6.3 says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in humans forever. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. So 120 years seems to be realistic at least in the eyes of the Bible and the Nei Ching, which are two of the most respected books about spiritual health. These are some of the oldest people ever. Shigechio Izumi, 120 years, died in 1986. Uh, in Azerbaijan, they claim to live 170 years, but they don't have good data, but the best documented was Jean Cal Calment, 122 years. Centenarians today are much, in October uh, 2001, U.S. Census Bureau said that we have 50,000 centenarian, centenarians, 35% increase. You see, it's becoming possible to live longer, and the key is to make it healthier. There's now a concept called escape velocity of aging, in Hippocrates' day, average lifespan was 35 years, and their goal was, well, let's see if we can double our lifespan. Well, as you all know, we've done it already. Average lifespan in the U.S. is over 70 years. Each year, we figure out that the reality is each year, we figure out how to live a few months longer. And some people say knowledge is accelerating so quickly that in eight years, some expect, expect us to be able to add more than one year of life each year by science. That's what they mean, escape velocity. Escaping death, question mark, 
of course, I, I don't think it's going to quite go that way, but the point is we are seeing greater and greater potential for vibrant longevity. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. In Okinawa, 81.2 years was the longest in the world. Do you know who lives longer than Okinawans? You'll be absolutely shocked. People in Hawaii, 81.3 years, we edged them out. That's one of the reasons I really like what, what we're doing here, because you know we have the best weather, we have the best air, the best water, and so forth. So these are the seven Ds of aging, disease, discomfort, dementia, drugs, disability, dependence, and death. How many of you want to avoid these things as we age? Well, the only one you can't avoid is death, so. But biological aging is measured with obesity, cholesterol, blood sugar, blood pressure, activity, smoking, drinking, and stress. You can't change chronological aging, but you can definitely change biological aging. These are some of the basic causes of aging. Toxicity, glycation, that's sugar sticking to everything. You know, they call it uh, producing AGE, advanced glycated end products. Plaque formation, you know, heart disease, Alzheimer's. Oxidation, that's why people promote ox antioxidants. Inflammation, de-energization, stagnation, hormone dysfunction, and isolation. This is what I mean by glycation. For example, what causes aging skin wrinkling? One of the causes is that when you have glycation, it starts to bind the collagen and it starts to get disruptive and your skin doesn't look smooth anymore. Oxidation basically is rusting. You know, when you cut an apple, it turns brown. Basically, it's the same as rusting. We're rusting when we get oxidized. Well, you pour some lemon juice on one side and it's protected. So we know that some foods can protect you from oxidation. So because of all of this knowledge, I have created a new paradigm of health. I'm a professor at the medical school, and I know what they teach. They teach medication and surgery, and if you have cancer, chemotherapy and radiation. But when I teach my medical students, I, I used to teach fourth year students, I would say, you know how to put people on medicine now, don't you? They'd confidently nod, yes. And then I would say, do you know how to get them off medication? And they'd give me a blank stare, like, oh, we never learned that. And then I said, didn't you come to medical school to be a healer? And of course, how many of you think doctors should be healers? Of course. And I said, if you can't get them off medicine, are you really a healer? And the answer is no, because if they're still on medicine, they're still sick, right? How many agree with that? So what I've done is I created a new paradigm of health where you start with more of the most natural approach to health. And you start with environment and diet and lifestyle and herbs and supplements and energy medicine, physical therapy, hormone balancing. And the last resort, we resort to medication and surgery. How many would agree that that's a better way? Isn't it funny how they should be teaching it this way, but they still don't. So how do we reverse aging? Well, we go right down the list that I just showed you. These are the steps to healthy aging. Healthy environment, stop smoking, for example. Good nutrition, lifestyle, some supplements, energy medicine, physical therapy, hormone balancing. Of course, don't forget to see your doctor and join our program if, you, if you're inclined. So what do I mean by, I'm going to start here. How do we improve our lifespan through environment? Well, environment, you know, the elements of our environment, earth, air, fire, and water, these are the old elements of alchemy. There are toxins and herbicides and phthalates and plastics and genetically modified items, those are the solid things. You know, water, if you have dirty water, you can, well, Flint, Michigan. Uh, air, of course, smoking is the worst pollution of air possible, and then you had Puno with the volcano. 
and then electronics. Fire, fire is the old representation of energy. Cell phones and uh, radiation are problems. So we need to start by optimizing our environment. But you see, genes affect many generations. But actually, the environment and lifestyle of many generations affect genes. Did you know that it goes both ways? That's called epigenetics. It's a new field. We realize that environmental exposures, including diet, by the way, and lifestyle, actually will change the expression of our genes enough so that we will start changing our next generation. So when we take care of our health, we start taking care of our next generation. I just put this on to show you that there's a Nobel Prize for people who realized that epigenetics was actually real. Smoking, one of the worst things that affects your environment. Glyphosates, the uh, rate of celiac disease has gone crazy with uh, glyphosate use, and it tracks almost exactly. Uh, hairspray, lipstick, it, you know, things that you put on your body can affect your health as well. Uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Nomura, who wrote a book, What the Health Too. You might want to read it. The, the subtitle is, They Told Us These Things Were Safe. And there's so many things they took. Remember how when they told us Teflon was safe? Remember when they told us cigarettes were safe? Oh my God. So detoxification becomes important because we have toxicity in our system and these are our organs of detoxification. Lungs will discharge volatiles. Our kidney will discharge liquids. Our liver will detox fat-soluble things. Kidney discharges water-soluble things. GI tract discharges solids. And, um, Spleen will clean our blood, and our skin is a multi multiple uh, detox system. And so this becomes one of the important things we need to do. And one of the more important reasons we need to exercise is exercise is one of the most important ways to detox. Why? Well, what happens when you exercise? You start blowing off junk, right? When you exercise, you circulate blood and your kidneys start filtering. You move blood through the liver, fat soluble things get uh, affected. Your GI tract becomes healthier. S uh, circulation will send blood through your spleen, through your lymphatic system. By the way, everyone forgets their lymphatic system. You know, if, if you're sitting around all day long, sedentary watching TV or playing on your iPhone or computer or iPad, you know, lymph, your lymphatic system is stagnant. It's just sitting there because the only thing that circulates it is your, is your exercise. And then, of course, sweating will cause de detox from skin. So exercise is important. Um, I don't have time to go through all kinds of things, but tea is great for, for detox because it helps to uh, flush toxins through the kidneys. Milk thistle helps the liver. But that can be the subject of a whole other talk, which I'll probably put on my YouTube channel. Diet. Diet's probably the biggest thing you can do. These are eight important aspects. There are many important aspects of nutrition. But in terms of aging, one of the most important things you can do is, believe it or not, calorie restriction. But just remember, I don't mean limiting how much food you eat. I mean eating so that you don't consume too many calories. Okay, I'll explain what I mean by that. I actually get people to eat more food and they still restrict calories. Cholesterol, you need to control. Blood pressure, blood sugar, inflammation, gut flora, cancer control, and epigenetics. Calorie restriction is one of the most consistent ways to extend life. Okinawans, compared to French, eat, eat the fewest calories. Well, you might think, well, that's because they're smaller in stature, but in Vilcabamba, in Peru, Abkhazia, in Russia, they're not much smaller, but then they eat fewer calories and they live much longer. Across species, calorie restriction in the dark bar. 
extends life, whether you're protozoa, crustaceans, arachnids, fish, or mammals. Every species lives longer if they restrict calories. And remember, I don't mean restrict food. I mean restrict calories. When people are under cal CR's calorie restriction, you see a reduction in heart disease, diabetes, cancer, endometrial disease, and basically you get healthier. This is what I mean by calorie restriction. Here's an apple, here's a muffin. The apple is 90 calories. So how many calories do you think is in the muffin? 350. It's actually 550. Okay, so do you see what I mean by calorie restriction? See, I would tell you, well, why don't you eat three apples? That's still only half the calories. You understand what I'm saying? And when they do it that way, uh, they lose weight very, very naturally in my programs. The, the other thing you can do is limit protein intake, okay? Now, what do I mean by limit protein intake? You know, you hear all the time you should be eating lots of protein, right? Well, studies show that high protein diets are associated with shorter lifespan. And so I'm, I really question why we're promoting so much protein intake. Um, if you go to my uh, website, AskDrShintani.com, I have about a, f a four or five minute video with the citations that support it. And look for the uh, video, Protein Paradox. These are some of the studies. High protein diet linked to cancer and death. High protein diet may accelerate aging more than we thought. So these are studies that confirm that. But if you'll go to my website uh, and look for the protein paradox, you'll see you can get a longer discourse about that. Uh, plaque formation, of course, cholesterol you know, is still nationally the number one cause of death, almost being overtaken by cancer, by the way. And of course, you need to control cholesterol. The higher the fat intake, the higher the cholesterol rate, and the higher the death rate from heart disease. Better cholesterol, you, you improve cholesterol by reducing saturated fat, total fat, reducing refined carbohydrates. Exercise doesn't change cholesterol. That's kind of a shock to people. Exercise will lower cholesterol only if it causes weight loss. But this is what happens when they follow my recommendations. I never went away from the meal feeling hungry or deprived. And that was one of the problems that I've had with diets in the past. I always had to eat a lot less food and I always seemed to be hungry. But not on Dr. Shintani's diet. When I first started this thing, my cholesterol level was about 235, something like that. And it went down 100 points in three weeks. I'm telling you, I was astounded. Um, I've been trying to get that cholesterol down for years and years. It's never been that low. Average cholesterol in our program, 21%. High blood pressure, of course, is important to control. Controlling cholesterol, blood sugar, sodium, stress, smoking, exercise, and increasing nitric oxide. These are high nitrate foods that help to increase your nitric oxide so that you can help control your blood pressure. Everybody hears about beets, but beets is actually, and beet greens actually are not the top nitric oxide producing foods. It's arugula, rhubarb, cilantro, lettuce, spring greens. But actually all the greens will help you control blood pressure. People's systolic pressure, and after being on my program, it drops dramatically. Uh, average blood, blood pressure reduction is 18%. Uh, control glycation. How many of you have heard you should eat less carbs to control blood sugar? You've all heard it, right? I asked them, why is it that the countries that eat the most carbohydrates have the least amount of diabetes? Do you understand what I'm saying? Right? Here's Japan. They eat a 70% carbohydrate diet. You know why, right? Their main staple is rice, right? But look at the diabetes rate. What, now, why would you tell people don't eat carbs when you come to Hawaii, you eat less carbs, and you have 300% rise in diabetes? You go to the mainland, which is Washington. This is in Washington state. This is a study done in Washington state. Lower, lower carbs, 
400% rise in diabetes. Do you see what's happening? See, people, even, even some of the best dietitians, don't realize what's going on. You see, this is something I try to impress on people. One of the things that's happening is when you eat lots of fat, you start causing insulin resistance, especially saturated fat, okay? So when somebody tells you don't eat carbs, what do you replace it with? Some people say, oh, you should eat more chicken, right? Or eat more, they call it protein, right? You know what's the problem when they say protein? What do they tell you, what is protein to most people? Chicken, beef, right, pork. Do you know that those are mostly fat? You know, average cut of beef, 65 to 70% fat. Average cut of pork is around 60% fat. Average cut of chicken, about 55% fat. If there were truth in advertising, they should be saying, which fat do you want to eat? Pork, beef, or chicken? Because it's more fat than chicken. Do you understand what I'm saying? And the other problem is that these, uh, these foods are higher in saturated fat. Much of it is saturated fat. So when you have lots of saturated fat, you actually contribute to insulin resistance, which is partly why you have the highest fat area, Washington State, having the highest rate of diabetes. Hawaii, still pretty high fat, having still 300% higher than low fat Japan. The other problem is A lot of the health people don't know how to talk about carbohydrates. I wrote a whole book about this about in 2002, right? In 2002, I wrote a book called The Good Carbohydrate Revolution. And I explained that carbohydrates are very different depending on their form, okay? Not necessarily their type but their form. What do I mean by that? How many of you have heard that you should eat complex carbs? Okay. And you should avoid simple carbs. How many of you heard that? Okay. Definition of a complex carb is starch. Right? Definition of a simple carb is sugar. Right? You all realize that, right? So here's a simple carb, apple. It's almost all sugar. Its glycemic number is 51. Here's a complex carb, white bread. Its glycemic number is 100. Now, do you know, understand, do you understand the glycemic index table? What this is saying is the same amount of this complex carb will raise blood sugar twice as much as the same amount of that simple carb. But I thought they said complex carbs are better, right? Well, wrong, okay? So what do they tell you to eat instead of white bread? Whole wheat bread, oh, whole wheat complex carb. Sugar is 93. Whole wheat bread is 99. Whole wheat bread is actually worse than table sugar. How many of you are surprised to hear that? Well, but that's the problem is that even our health professionals aren't aware of the differences. Then you say, well, what should I eat? Well, here's the problem, okay? If you divide it between simple and complex, you have no idea which is better because you have simple sugars like glucose that are really bad and apples and cherries that are pretty good. The sugars, but they're pretty good. Complex carbs, you have some that are really bad and some that are pretty good, like stone ground whole wheat bread. But do you see what I'm getting at? You, can't def you cannot just say simple carb, complex carb. What they should be saying is if you divide it this way between processed 
You see, all the processed carbs are bad, whether they're simple or complex. All the unprocessed food, apples, brown rice, stone ground whole wheat bread, these are unprocessed. They're pretty good. Now, why do I say whole wheat bread is processed? You ever see commercial whole wheat flour? It's very fine. It's like a powder. And when they grind up flour, whole wheat flour, into a fine powder, it starts acting like sugar. And you know what's the other problem with whole wheat bread? If it's not organic, it's probably laced with glyphosate. Okay? You all know what glyphosate is? Glyphosate is Roundup. It's weed killer. Okay? Now, let me tell you the problem with whole wheat bread, commercial whole wheat bread. Commercial whole wheat bread, if it's not organic, may be harvested by chemical means. In other words, some of the wheat in this country may, I don't know, might be most of it, is harvested like this. When the wheat is ripe, they douse it with Roundup. They don't, the, no, it's not the weeds now. They actually spray it right on the plant. Why do they do that? They want to kill the plant so that it dries up before harvest. Then the harvest is easier. Okay? You understand the concept? So that it dries out, and then when the harvesting machine comes by, it's, it's lighter and they can harvest more. They call that a drying agent. You know what's the problem with this drying agent? It's now on your wheat. And you know what? It's even in higher concentrations on commercial whole wheat because they don't mill the outside off. Okay? So I always tell people if they're going to do bread, you should do organic. All right? And a lot of, um, a lot of the problems people uh, attribute to gluten sensitivity might actually be Roundup. Uh, because it's, it, the resi those residues actually will indeed cause leaky gut syndrome, right? Oh, sourdough bread. Actually, sourdough bread, I'm, that's, a, that's a really good question. Interestingly, sourdough bread's glycemic number drops quite well. And uh, the reality is sourdough bread produces propionic acid when, you know, when they ferment it to get the sour, uh, taste, and acidic things like vinegar will slow the absorption of sugar. So that's actually a really interesting thing. So if I have to eat white bread, my choice would be sourdough, okay? And let me just say one more thing. Um, when you talk about carbs, uh, when you, uh, there are several things you can do with carbs that will slow down it's an absorption. And one of the interesting things is uh, if you chill it and reheat it, it slows down the absorption. It's really an interesting phenomenon. Um, by the way, this lady, I took her off insulin. How soon after you began the Hawaiian diet did you stop taking insulin altogether? It was my second week on the diet. No, it was. Two weeks two, out. Two weeks on the diet. We've done that with even uh, worse cases with people who had even more insulin. Dr. Shintani published the results of his diet in the respected American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. In his study, the average dieter lost 17 pounds. Cholesterol counts dropped 14%. Blood pressure and blood sugar improved as well, all in just three weeks. All right, so the importance of blood sugar control is that uh, glycation is one of the markers for aging. And it's, uh, high blood sugar will start to cause the glycosylation of all kinds of proteins. That's one of the reasons why if you're diabetic, you know, or pre-diabetic, you know they'll start checking your hemoglobin A1C. That's just a measure of how much glycation is happening in your body. And by the way, this affects brain function as much as anything because some people are, are calling Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes because of uncontrolled blood sugar causing plaque formation through poor circulation and glycosylation of proteins in the brain.
Don't try to get off your insulin without physician supervision. Another issue is that a lot of people have heard that they should start avoiding gluten. How many of you heard that? Okay. And then, of course, that affects flour products, all right? So if you go to um, my website, AskDrShintani.com, I have three videos about it. One of them is how they're very wrong about gluten. But I also have two videos about what might be causing it instead of gluten. But watch this. So what about inflammation and chronic pain? You know, they, a lot of folks say that most chronic diseases are related to inflammation. In fact, some people even say all diseases of aging have to do with inflammation. And it's true, there's a lot of diseases, including allergies, arthritis, asthma, autoimmune disease, and actually a much bigger list of diseases that are related to inflammation. Here's some of them. Cancer, cardiovascular disease. Why cardiovascular disease? Do you know that they're now realized that inflammatory markers are a better predictor of cardiovascular disease than cholesterol? Now, I don't mean cholesterol doesn't predict heart disease. I'm saying that inflammation appears to be even more important than cholesterol. So here people are taking statins to control cholesterol for heart disease, well, they should be also paying attention to controlling inflammation. Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a classic inflammatory disease. Why? You know what happens in Alzheimer's disease? They have what they call neurofibrillary tangles and senile plaques, scar tissue forming in the brain causing blockages of nerve impulses. Pulmonary diseases, of course, uh, they advertise these drugs that pre prevent inflammation to help with diseases such as asthma, asthma and COPD. Classically, arthritis is an inflammatory disease. Autoimmune disease, what do I mean by autoimmune disease? Uh, autoimmune disease includes things like rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, myasthenia gravis, type 1 diabetes, there's so many diseases that are autoimmune and it's actually rising because we live in a very toxic pro-inflammatory uh, environment. Neurological diseases, we just mentioned Alzheimer's, but they say that Parkinson's disease and other forms of dementia and movement disorders are inflammatory in nature because in Parkinson's disease, inflammatory uh, inflammation starts to burn out the substantia nigra and you can't make dopamine, and when you can't make dopamine, you can't control your movements. Diabetes is inflammatory because they believe inflammation starts to affect your ability, your, the, um, the ability to ins of insulin to work properly. In other words, it's a trigger to what is known as insulin resistance. So let's talk about other triggers to inflammation and autoimmune diseases. Now, when we talk about autoimmune disease or inflammation, Certain proteins can cause autoimmune disease, especially if you have some kind of allergy to them. One of the most classic forms of protein that causes autoimmune disease is dairy protein. Um, they actually have noticed that uh, the countries that consume the most dairy has the most type 1 diabetes. And now what they're figuring is that the high prevalence of type 1 diabetes may well be because a section of the protein in dairy protein looks like the surface of your beta cells in your pancreas. Okay, and the beta cells are the cells that produce insulin. Now, if you're constantly exposed to dairy protein, your body starts causing an immune reaction to that particular protein. And if you're unlucky enough, if your beta cells are genetically predisposed to look like the sequence, the amino acid sequence in dairy protein, what happens is the, um, the body starts attacking the dairy protein and at the same time it'll start attacking the beta cells. And, and by the way, this usually happens in childhood poor kid starts to 
be unable to produce insulin and they get type 1 diabetes. It's one of the most tragic things because uh, we feed our kids so much dairy and it's cow's milk, right? It's not human milk, it's cow's milk. And we start producing this very, very bad uh, disease as a result. So that's one example of proteins causing autoimmune disease. Now, infection can cause autoimmune disease. Now they're finding that some uh, autoimmune diseases are caused by hidden, or occult, they call it occult, means hidden, occult infections. Uh, I'll give you an example. One of my <coughs> colleagues was hospitalized with um, uh, viral encephalitis. And in the process of being infected with viral encephalitis, uh, his body just went downhill. And um, he started having um, what they call ITP, uh, idiopathic thrombocytopenia. Now, idiopathic thrombocytopenia is, um, is are examples of autoimmune diseases where your body wipes out your platelets and then you start having problems with clotting and bleeding. And um, they couldn't figure out what was causing it and they had to keep replacing his platelets and he kept having problems with bleeding. And one of his dentists said, maybe you have a dental infection that's triggering this autoimmune response because he noticed that um, my colleague had had a lot of problems with dental work. So he had a uh, root canal that had become abscessed, removed, and within two days his platelets became normal. Now it's not just dental work, they're now finding that chronic infections, uh, by, uh, bacterial infections um, of uh, the liver, they actually found bacterial colonization of the liver, of gut flora. In other words, the bacteria had sneaked in from the gut and populated the liver, and it was so benign, relatively benign, they couldn't find it in blood work, but then he started having very, very bad rheumatoid arthritis. Until recently, they had didn't realize that that's actually a real phenomenon. So infections can cause autoimmune disease, toxins, of course, uh, other allergies. Nightshades are strange because nightshades are tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, and peppers, and tobacco. And some people, unfortunately, can't handle nightshades. It's a very small population, but some people have autoimmune reactions from nightshades. And of course, we talked about leaky gut. Fat imbalance, how many of you have heard you should take omega-3s for inflammation or pain, right? How many of you have heard that you should limit omega-6? Only a few, right? Right? Only a few, but only a few of you have heard that. Well, in my programs, I cut down omega-6 fats, and pain goes away. Now, I don't get paid for telling people to cut down omega-6 because I'm not selling them a product. But actually, that's actually a better way because the flip side of it is, uh, I've had two patients, I've had a couple of patients come in. I remember this one patient who came in with, uh, to me. She said she was a dancer, she was on no medication, she took a bunch of supplements, and she uh, was hospitalized, and they couldn't figure out why she was so anemic. What happened was, one day she had a bowel movement, it was full of blood. So she went to the emergency room and they found out her blood count had been dropping. So they presumed that she probably had cancer. But they scoped her from the bottom and the top and they didn't find anything. They checked her blood, she didn't have a bleeding disorder. And so she came to see me. I started the Department of Alternative Medicine's clinic. So I get a lot of hard cases. She said, the doctors can't figure out why a healthy person like me had all this blood bleeding. And I looked at her supplements and I could tell immediately she was taking a, a supplement that had omega-3s in it. She took ginseng, garlic, ginger, turmeric, and krill oil. Do you know what those things have in common? Anybody? 
They're all blood thinners. Yeah, they're all blood thinners. She was taking blood thinner upon blood thinner upon blood thinner. See, the, I'm, I'm telling you this saying that it's better to do things naturally than adding something. And so she thought she was being healthy by adding krill oil on top of all of these supplements. And she had basically anticoagulated herself. So that's one of the reasons why I rather you people balance omega-6s and omega-3s rather than just piling on the omega-3s. Obesity is clearly associated with autoimmune disease, dysbiosis, that's bad gut flora, and poor nutrition. This has to do with gut flora also. When your gut flora is not healthy, you're not healthy. And it's something that has come to the fore in the last probably five or 10 years. Uh, there are thousands of articles now on gut flora. In fact, some people think that's the key to all diseases, which I don't agree with. But we know that gut flora plays a, a major role in many conditions. Uh, this came about because when they, would when they would transplant gut flora from a slim mouse into a normal mouse, the mouse became slim. When they transplant obese gut flora into a normal mouse, it became fat. And when they transplant, transplanted uh, gut flora from a skinny mouse, the normal mouse became skinny. It was really uh, amazing, the results that came up. So we know that gut flora can affect uh, many health conditions, including your weight control, uh, but now they say it affects your nervous system. 90% of your serotonin is produced in the gut. It helps train the immune system. It produces vitamins and minerals. It affects bone metabolism. Uh, it helps you digest food and actually helps to slow down or regulate the absorption of sugar. Uh, in fact, this bacteria, Acromantia mucinophila, inversely correlates with inflammation and obesity, and it also affects autoimmune disease. So you should be looking at probiotics. And in my, uh, you notice yogurt isn't on here, and in my YouTube channel I ex explain why I don't see yogurt as a health food. But probiotics are kind of useless without prebiotics. What do I mean by that? You know the old story in the Bible about good seed on bad soil? You know, probiotics are like good seed, but if you're still eating crap, you're gonna have a crappy result, you know? Um, you, the, the gut flora needs healthy uh, fiber to grow and thrive and support long-term uh, healthy gut flora. Controlling cancer. Um, cancer strikes one in two men, one in three women. It's absolutely frightening now. In 1971, it was one out of 21. How did it go so fast? And part of the answer is, we have a very toxic cancer carcinogenic environment. But also, it's tied in with diet. You can see when fat intake goes up, breast cancer rates go up astronomically. Not small amounts, but massive amounts. Prostate cancer, same thing. When you see developed countries eating more and more fat, prostate cancer goes up dramatically. It also goes up with protein consumption. Remember I showed you that other slide showing that high protein diets are associated with almost fourfold increase in cancers. Well, it shows up here as well. Uh, I have a diagram called stairway to cancer, but at every step along the way, you can inhibit cancer or turn it around. Also, epigenetics. This is another new field. Now, epigenetics means how your diet or your environment or what you do affects genetic expression. Some people say cancer is caused by epigenetic changes. Uh, in other words, by what you eat, you, you may, or by what you're exposed to, or maybe you're smoking, you start to turn on what's called oncogenes. Well, there's also longevity genes. The genes are called sirtuins. And we now realize that certain foods can activate these sirtuins. Sirtuins are genes that are associated with longevity. 
And these are some of the foods, black currants, green tea, kale, broccoli, capers, miso, tofu, dark chocolate, chocolate, parsley, olives, onions, turmeric. So that's, you know, all that was about diet. Now what about lifestyle? Exercise is one of the most important things you can do. But here's, the, here's something that a lot of folks don't realize. Too little or too much exercise can promote inflammation. So just make sure you exercise daily if possible, but not too much. I had a, a patient come in and said, you know, I'm a marathoner, isn't that good? And I said, for some people, but you have to realize that marathoning isn't for, every, for everyone. Because think about it, the first marathoner in history died after his marathon. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? The Greek, the Greek myth. The word marathon came from a man who ran 26 point something miles, delivered a message that they had won their battle, and he dropped dead. But over 10,000 steps a day may reduce diabetes, so it's important because it helps you burn off the calories. Sleep. Sleep is important too. Again, too much or too little sleep can increase inflammation. A lot of folks don't realize that, that you can actually sleep too much or too little. Oh, is there too late in the day to exercise? Yeah, I, I tell people don't exercise three hours before they go to bed because they'll be in sympathetic mode and hard times, hard, they'll have a hard time sleeping. Yeah, but otherwise, same thing with diet. I mean, I, don't, I tell people don't eat after th three hours before going to bed. This is a friend of mine. He tells me, hey, Terry, I haven't seen you in years. I knew him since the 70s. He says, let's go have lunch. And I said, boy, Stuart, what are you doing in your retirement? He says, ah, retirement's overrated. I got so bored, I went back to selling real estate. And I said, how old are you now anyway? 102. Okay, now think about it. 102, and he's still got the mind to sell real estate. And I said, what's your secret? And he says, well, you know, I eat pretty good, not as good as you recommend, but pretty good. And I exercise every day. He swims every day. So just keep that in mind, because he motivated me to start exercising. I used to exercise, you know how they say, two, three times a week. Now, I'm, now it's like five to seven times a week. You want to know a daily habit that cuts breast cancer risk in half? How many want to know that? The women, anyway, right? Believe it or not, sleeping properly will cut breast cancer risk in half. How do we know? Blind women have half the risk of breast cancer, and they think it's because when they're, they can't see light, melatonin is produced. And so now they realize melatonin can help with cancer. You want to know another secret to longer life? Well, you have to go to my website because <laughs> this is about a couple of minute video and I'm running out of time. Herbs and supplements. It's not just diet, it's herbs and supplements. Now they're finding that these are some anti-aging herbs that you should be taking. By the way, these are kind of also food, right? Um, these are anti-inflammatory, antioxidants. Here's, here's additional anti-aging su supplements. Uh, I want to point out two of them that are really in the news now. Uh, astaxanthin, and actually there's a new uh, form of astaxanthin called xanthacin, uh, which is a pharmaceutical grade astaxanthin. It's absorbed three times better. Xanthacin has been researched by NIH to promote long life because it turns on a gene, it's, it has an epigenetic effect of turning on FOXO3, which is a gene, it's actually a sirtuin, it's a gene that promotes longevity. And they are now studying that uh, at the NIH for its effect. The other one, resveratrol, also seems to contribute to uh, longevity. But all of these are antioxidants and anti-inflammatory foods. Yeah, this is rapamycin. It's one of the first pharmacological agents shown to extend lifespan in mammalian species. That's why they're so interested in this. They're now also looking at metformin. 
Now, metformin is the first-line drug for diabetes, but you have to realize metformin was developed from goat's rue or French lilac. It actually came out of an herbal substance. Um, the other thing that they're, my, they start looking at is berberine, because berberine is also associated with control of blood sugar. Hormone balancing. Hormone balancing is important because now we find that hormones can have a profound effect on our health. Uh, thyroid, growth hormone, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, adrenal, DHE, and pregnenolone. Uh, it also has a lot of effect on our mood. I've actually turned a couple of people who were actually suicidal because they felt so depressed around simply by fixing their thyroid hormone or their progesterone or their cortisol. How many of you would like to learn of a hormone that can reduce breast cancer by 80% or colon cancer by uh, 60%? Well, actually, vitamin D is actually a hormone. And they find that high vitamin D levels are associated with lower risk of certain cancers. So don't forget to also see your doctor because your doctor might be able to find other illnesses that, you know, I, you know, I talk about all the natural ways to do things, but I'm not saying don't see your doctor. You should get your annual checkup, your colonoscopy. Um, the question whether mammograms are useful nowadays, but um, I'm not saying don't see your doctor. Thank you for your time. Aloha. Mahalo to all of you for coming and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone.